You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 26, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, subcutaneous immunotherapy. Our presenter is Dr. Harold Nelson. He's a professor of medicine at National Jewish Health in Denver, Colorado. Um, Good morning, everyone. This is Conferences Online and Allergy. Today is July 26th of 2021. Today, we're honored to have Dr. Hal Nelson uh, present with us. He's an allergist immunologist at National Jewish Health in Denver, Colorado. Um, Like usual, I go and steal information off the web to to, um, read about our presenters. Um, I've known of Dr. Nelson for 25 years or so now, but uh, his body of work is huge. He's over 400 articles and book chapters. He's Board of Regents at the American College, Board of Directors, ABAI. Um, uh, He's been uh, instrumental in the first, second, and third expert panels of NIH guidelines for diagnosis of asthma. He's received a fellow distinguished award as well as the Gold Headed Cane Award at the American College. Uh, for the fellows who attend that, you'll realize how important all that is. Um, he's re- received multiple distinguished clinician awards and distinguished service awards throughout the, the nation here. He's been uh, present in the World Allergy Organization, has had a Lifetime Achievement Award at National Jewish. Um, with all that, there is so much more, but uh, we need to get to the, the presentation. So today, Dr. Nelson will be presenting on uh, uh, pr- principles of traditional allergy and immunotherapy. Thanks, uh, Dr. Nelson, for being here. Okay, well, thank you for the uh, kind introduction, and uh, I'm sorry we're having to slap this together, but uh, I'm sure it'll work fine. Now, uh, I guess I'll have to tell you when to move the slides. So let's go on. Yeah, I have no conflict of interest. So we'll we'll get started with the talk. So this is the present status of subcutaneous immunotherapy, or SCIT. Uh, It has these uh, attributes. uh, Proven efficacy for allergic rhinitis, asthma, hymenoptera, venom sensitivity, and selected patients with atopic dermatitis. That's nowhere as firm an indication as the other three. Uh, We'll see about identified effective doses there are for the uh, standardized extracts and a few of the non-standardized. A very important point that I'll dwell on later because it's possibly a difference from SLIT and that's that it's effective in multi-allergen mixes. And then there are the disease-modifying activities, the prevention of new sensitization. you notice that's only in monosensitized patients, not polysensitized. The progression in patients who only have allergic rhinitis to the development of asthma. And finally, the persistence of efficacy after stopping. And finally, the duration that is required to achieve these outcomes has been established, and it is at least three years. Next slide. On the other hand, there are certain problems with SCIT. It's inconvenient because it has to be delivered in a physician's office. There is, of course, the occurrence of systemic reactions much more frequently than with SLIT, and there are rare fatalities but fatalities are not reported with SLED. Next slide, please. So now we'll look at the first of these characteristics. It's proven efficacy. Next slide, please. And this is a very uh, impressive study that was done at Johns Hopkins many years ago. Uh, These are patients going through their second ragweed season under treatment. The hatched line is the ragweed pollen count in Baltimore. The green line is the patients on placebo. And the red line is the patients receiving ragweed now for the second year. And you notice this is about an 80% reduction in symptoms. This is really remarkable when you think about symptomatic therapy for allergic rhinitis, where antihistamines 
are better than placebo by about 13 or 14 percent and nasal steroids just a little over 20 percent. Next slide please. There was a lot of controversy about whether it worked for asthma which is obviously a much more complex condition than allergic rhinitis. On the left is the first pub or actually the second publication of a meta-analysis by a group of Australian pulmonologists and if you know meta-analyses you know the white line horizontal white line uh, is the important one because anything to the left of that favors immunotherapy for the treatment of asthma and anything to the right of it favors the placebo and the diamonds at the bottom of each cluster uh, are the uh, summary of the data above and it was effective but in uh, 2010 they updated it now with 88 trials about half of them house dust mite and about a quarter of them pollen and here they the results were even more uh, impressive they reduced the symptom score by a standardized mean deviation of uh, 0.59, which doesn't mean anything to anybody, but is uh, a good result. Medication score was reduced. Specific and nonspecific bronchial hyperresponsiveness were improved. That is, bronchial response not only to the antigen being administered, but to histamine or methicoline. Next slide, please. And this is a small meta-analysis on Hymenoptera, seven controlled trials of different insects, uh, venoms with 392 participants. And as far as systemic reactions, they were reduced in the active group to 2.7% and the untreated group 39.8% when they received subsequent stings. And also large local reactions which can be quite bothersome, were reduced by over 50%. Next slide, please. This is the uh, meta-analysis for the uh, atopic dermatitis. Uh, they uh, used six randomized controlled trials with 295 subjects. Overall, immunotherapy had a significant positive effect with an odds risk of 4.27 and you'll note that four of the six studies independently reported significant improvement. Now this looks quite good but there are three there are two other meta-analyses for atopic dermatitis. One found no improvement and the second found modest improvement. So it's not as clear-cut as for the other conditions. Next slide please. So now we'll look at effective doses. Slide, please. And this is an example of how you determine effective doses. This is a very nice study done by Tony Prue in the United Kingdom. Uh, he gathered 347 patients who were being treated in general practice in the UK and had been inadequately uh, control for symptoms the previous year with antihistamines, topical steroids, and eye drops. So these people were randomized then to one of three treatments. A high dose that contained 20 micrograms of the major uh, Timothy uh, allergen Flippy 5, a low dose that contained one tenth that amount, or placebo. And this was a single pre-seasonal course of treatment. Next slide, please. These are the results. You can see with the high dose, which had been previously shown to be effective, uh, symptoms re were reduced 32 percent and medication use re was reduced 41 percent, which are quite, quite good results, uh, about double what can be achieved with medication. The low dose group, on the other hand, symptoms were relieved only 19%, borderline significant, and medication use only 14%, which was not significant. So this is a nice study that defines an effective dose, 
which is quite effective, and a lower dose, one-tenth that amount, which is relatively ineffective and probably not worth using. Next, uh, next slide, please. And this is uh, data that was compiled from a number of randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies. You'll see on the left uh, the, made, the standardized allergen extracts, except the bottom three, which are not standardized, but have been studied. Next is the major allergen that was measured. Uh, next are the effective doses. And you can see, surprisingly enough, considering how different these are, most of the effective doses fall within a relatively narrow range, the exception being the Alton area, which is lower than the others. And then on the right column, you can see less or ineffective doses. We've seen the one for Timothy already. It was uh, 0.2 micrograms versus 20 microgram micrograms. And you can see for all of the ones where they've been determined in the same study, they tend to be one-fifth or one-tenth of the effective dose. So it's a pretty steep dose response curve. Next slide, please. Now, how do we use that information on major allergen content when, except for ragweed, it's not listed on any of the American bottles uh, that are available to use? Well, fortunately, the various companies, and this data is from ALK, but other companies have done the same thing, have measured, and in this case, they not only measured, as you'll see in the fourth column over, the mean major allergen content of their own extracts, but as you'll see in the far right column, they studied extracts from all of the other extract companies in the United States and the uh, FDA standards for the standardized ones. And these are the potency of the pollen extracts. And I'll have you point out, notice first, that they're quite high, as you'll see. The uh, standardized ones are all up in the mid-100s. Bermuda is a little weaker than most pollens. And if you look down in the non-standardized, you'll see again in the far right column that they're pretty much in the same range, some higher, some lower, but on an average about the same range. So the difference with the non-standardized is not that they're weaker, but that they're less uh, reproducible. Next slide. Now these are the potency of the environmental extracts. And remember, the grasses were up in the hundreds, as were most of the others, mid-hundreds, in fact. Here you'll see that the uh, house this mite, the first two in cat, are much weaker, 62, 63, 73, 85, and 40. Now, on the non-standardized, the important one is dog. And non-standardized dogs, for the most part, are extremely weak. The mean, AL, the mean range of U.S. extracts, as you see, was 0.5 to 7.2 micrograms of CANF1. The exception is the acetone precipitated dog extract made by Hollister Steer. This is made by an entirely different system, and they can see the mean content when it was assessed by ALK is 140, and I called Hollister Steer recently, and it's right at 140 still. So the dog, all the other dog extracts are too weak to be useful for immunotherapy, but Hollister Steer AP dog uh, is quite potent. Next slide, please. And these are the cockroach and mold extracts. And you'll see again, very weak. Uh, cat was the weakest standardized extract, and these are about half the potency of cat, or at best the potency of cat for the cockroach, and the molds are very weak. Now the trouble here is that except for Alton area, none of these have been studied in randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials. And therefore, although they're very weak and it looks like they probably would not be effective for immunotherapy, we don't know because except for Alton area, uh, they haven't been studied. Take Alton area, however, 
Remember, the recent one was 8 micrograms of Alt-A1, and you can see none of the extracts had even that much per milliliter, so you would be using over a milliliter of the uh, concentrated extract uh, in order to reach that level of treatment. Next slide, please. Now, how do we use this information from the last few slides to prescribe an extract? Well, first, let's assume that we are filling a 10 ml maintenance vial and that the person receives 0.5 for each maintenance injection. In that case, the 10 ml vial must have 20 times the maintenance dose of the major allergen. So an example, the optimum Timothy maintenance dose should contain 20 micrograms of Phil P5 because it's wrong. <laughs> Pardon me. Okay, yeah, that's the, the maintenance injection. Should contain 20 micrograms. All right, that's right. The 10 ml vial then must contain 20 times that much or 400 micrograms of FIP 5 Now, the 100,000 BAU per milliliter Timothy extract, the way it comes from the company, contains on an average 620 micrograms per milliliter. So if you divide the 400 micrograms required by the 620 per milliliter, you come out that the 10 ml vial has to be, has to contain 0.6 milliliters of concentrated Timothy extract. Next slide, please. So if we go through that, we find a clear sense, and that is you can't, as some people do, add the same amount of each extract and either not grossly overdose some people or grossly underdose the other. You notice that the uh, short ragweed and timothy, both pollens, uh, require very little. The mites and the, the uh, AP dog require four to five times that much extract to be added to the maintenance file, and CAT requires about 15 times as, as much extract to be added to the maintenance file. Next slide, please. Now, to save you from that effort, <clears throat> the last iteration of the pra immunotherapy practice parameters used the same information and calculated it in terms of FDA dosage. So you'll see in the third column over that they offer a range of doses uh, for the, the standardized extracts. Uh, that's a little disturbing because we know for many extracts, if you go down five-fold, you lose efficacy, and yet these ranges are generally four-fold, or in the case of bermugrass, five-fold. So on the far right, I have gone back and reinterpreted the data uh, from the uh, other slides into BAU. And what you'll find is that you should be using the upper range of the doses that are recommended in the uh, practice parameters, at least the, in the upper half of what's recommended. Next slide. Now, they only recommend for the standardized extracts where studies have been done uh, in terms that you just looked at but people have to have some guidance as to what to do with the non-standardized extracts. So they recommended that the probable range of effective doses for the non-standardized pollens is a tenfold dilution of either the aqueous or the glycerinated extract. And uh, that's a little high, but it's probably safest to do that because some of the unstandardized grass pollens are fairly weak. But you realize that, that the standardized Timothy and ragweed only required 
0.5, and here you're putting in twice that much for the non-standardized pollens. For the cockroach, they recommend, and actually all of the fungi as well, they recommend the highest tolerated dose because there's no data on how much is needed, but it's recognized that the extracts are very weak. Next slide, please. All right, now uh, this is an important point, the evidence that multi-allergen mixes are effective. And I will, oops, okay. Um, I will tell you now that the uh, Europeans, academic Europeans, and most practicing Europeans don't believe this. They try to determine the single most effective extract, and that's all they give. Or if they can't decide between two, they will give them as separate extracts, and they will do such things as giving them 30 minutes apart, or even starting one a year before the other. So it's very contentious between Europe and the United States, where routinely multiple allergen mixes are given by injection. Okay, next slide now, please. And this is a great study, an old study done at the Mass General Hospital by Lowell, Francis Lowell and Bill Franklin. And it's wonderful because all the things that they proved but first, how they did it, they took patients who were receiving a multiple allergen mix that contained ragweed, and then they followed them through a ragweed pollen season, and they selected out those who were still significantly symptomatic despite receiving ragweed, and they paired them matched on their symptom scores during the ragweed pollen season of 1962. Then in March 1963, they put in caramelized sugar uh, saline for the ragweed and have one of each pair. Now they did that so that the color would be similar. And then they monitored symptoms during the ragweed season of 1964. Next slide, please. And this shows the results. <clears throat> These are symptom medication scores. The hatch lines are those who had the ragweed removed. The solid lines are those who continue to receive ragweed, their mean and median values. And then, and I hope you can see it because it's covered up on mine, there are six stars at asterisks at the bottom that show that for six weeks during the ragweed season, the difference was significant. Uh, between the two groups, 0.05, five weeks, and 0.01, the sixth week. So it clearly was very, the ragweed had been and still was very effective in a multi-allergen mix, and that's indicated by the fact that removing it caused a marked increase in symptoms. Next slide, please. Now that was one small study, but they repeated exactly the same study the next year, but this time instead of removing the ragweed, they reduced it 95% because there were allergists who were using this weaker solution of ragweed and maintaining that it was perfectly adequate. Next slide, please. And here again, we see the same thing. The hatched are those who had the reduced ragweed, the solid lines, those who had the, uh, continued to receive the full dose of ragweed. Here you can see the uh, only three weeks that the symptoms are significant, but two of them are highly significant. Next slide, please. So here in two studies, one replicating the other, they showed that subcutaneous allergy immunotherapy is effective. And it was the first study that really showed that because they had a very effective uh, placebo. Uh, first, it was the same color as the, those who were getting ragweed. But the other thing is what, that they had local reactions to the other allergens that were in the placebo extract. And therefore, people could not distinguish 
between active and placebo. They showed it was dose dependent and they showed it was effective when administered as a mixture of unrelated allergen extracts. Next slide, please. Now, two other considerations uh, in prescribing um, skit with mixed uh, extracts. The first is cross allergenicity, the second is the effect of proteases on the other allergen extracts. Slide, please. So, what do you do with cross allergenicity? And this occurs quite a bit, particularly with grasses, nearly as much with weed families, quite strongly between the two house dust mites and in the whole group of cedar jun junipers called by many different names, very highly cross-reactive. The recommendation is when you have one of these groups, you either take one that's locally most important if you have it, or if there are many that are important, to make up a mixture, but treat it as a single extract in the amount that you use. Next slide, please. The other problem is protease activity, and this is not present significantly in pollens, danders, or house dust mites, but it is present in cockroaches and in all of the fungi. Next slide, please. Without going through the many studies that have been done, the conclusions that have been reached are that you do not mix the non protease containing po uh, pollens, danders, or houseless mite extracts with extracts of either fungi or cockroach. None of them. You also don't mix fungal, fungal extracts with cockroach because they have been shown to degrade each other, presumably because they contain different proteases. And because these proteases will degrade the, the proteins in the, the extracts in which they occur, uh, only extracts with 50% glycerin should be used for fungi and cockroaches. Next slide, please. Now we're going to take in the whole issue or matter or characteristic of disease modification. And there are three ways that that's demonstrated. The first is that if you give monosensitized patients immunotherapy, they're much less apt to develop additional sensitivities. If you give patients, it's been best shown in children, but it also has been shown in adults, who only have allergic rhinitis immunotherapy, they are less likely to develop asthma. And then finally, if you give them long enough treatment, it has to be at least three years, and you produce a clinical improvement, this will persist after stopping for a very well period of time. And then the last characteristic is that the time and doses necessary to achieve these outcomes have been determined. Next slide, please. So here's the data on new sensitizations. This was done by Giovanni Paino in Sicily. Uh, they identified 134 children ages five to eight years who had intermittent asthma with or without rhinitis and were only sensitized to house dust mite. All the children were offered immunotherapy. In 75 per children, the parents accepted, and in 63, the parents rejected immunotherapy. Next slide, please. So they were given immunotherapy for three years, and then they were followed three years more for persistence of effect before uh, the outcome uh, was assessed. The maintenance dose in these children was about half the customary adult dose. I should say that generally children are given the same dose as adults. So at the end of six years, three years of immunotherapy and three years of uh, no immunotherapy, about a quarter of the patients, children who had been given immunotherapy had developed new positive skin tests 
in addition to house tests might could two-thirds of those who were only treated with medication had developed similar um, pos new positive skin tests. And it's interesting, almost the same percentages have been replicated in two other studies. Slide, please. Now, this is the study with SCIT on the prevention of asthma development by specific immunotherapy. I'm sure whoever lectures to you on SLIT will show one that's much more impressive, more recent and more impressive. But anyway, the PAD study was done in children 7 to 13 years of age who had allergic rhinitis and no asthma when they were followed through a year of observation. They were then placed on immunotherapy with either Birch or Timothy or both if they were positive by skin test to both. They received three years of immunotherapy and were followed up two years and seven years after immunotherapy was stopped. Slide. And this is the result. Three years was the end of immunotherapy. Five years was two years after discontinuation. Ten years was seven years after discontinuation. You see the uh, under skit, 60 with no asthma, 19 with asthma, 60, 15, 48, 16. And for the control group treated only with medication, obviously higher, 40, 32, 38, 29, 29, 24. So the likelihood, the odds ratio of developing asthma if you were control was about 2.5. Next slide, please. Now we look at persistent efficacy, and this is a study um, from Vienna, Austria. 108 patients who stopped treatment after they had received grass pollen immunotherapy for three or four years for allergic rhinitis and had had a good symptomatic response. The maintenance dose that they received contained 12 micrograms of group 5 allergens, which is a little bit low but not bad. And then these people received a questionnaire annually after the grass pollen season to determine if they had a recurrence of symptoms. Next slide. So here we have year one, two, three, and four after the discontinuation of the grass immunotherapy. The orange is those with persisting good results and the yellow is those with a symptomatic uh, grass pollen season. And we can see, we should remember this, when they do group studies for three years or even longer, uh, they see continuing effects. But it isn't uniform. So here, even the first year, uh, a very small percent, about 3% had symptoms. They lost their results almost immediately, even though they had had three to four years of treatment. It went up to 17% the second year and 31% the third year. The numbers drop off sharply thereafter and probably aren't uh, reliable. But it shows that even though we say, yes, you get three years of, of uh, continuing remission, uh, it's not true for everybody. Slide, please. Now, the drawbacks of uh, SCID are inconvenience and the occurrence of systemic reactions. Next slide, please. This was a study uh, in private practice where they noticed that a lot of their patients that they put on SCID were stopping before the first year was ended. So they called these people to find out why they stopped, and inconvenience was the reason in over 50% of the patients with allergic rhinitis and about a quarter of the patients with asthma. The inconvenience mostly of having to drive to a doctor's office, having to wait there 30 minutes after the injection. Next slide, please. Now we look at, at uh, reactions, in, in this case, fatal reactions. These were two surveys sent out 
by the immunotherapy committee of the uh, academy, uh, and each time uh, they listed information on 17 fatal reactions. Uh, there were probably more than that, but they didn't get uh, good information. But they did turn out uh, some interesting things. And the first, that asthma was a major risk, you'll notice that of the patients on whom they got information whether they had asthma or not, 88% did, even though it was estimated that probably there were three or four or five times as many patients with only allergic rhinitis getting shots as there were who had asthma. And particularly if the asthma was labile, this or severe, uh, this was a great risk. There were two other risks that were identified. One was the first injection from a new vial, since presumably the old vial had lost potency in one or more of its constituents. And with the, the new vial and that constituent was at full potency, it induced a fatal reaction. It's customary to drop the dose back because of that reason. And finally, the other was dosing error. Next slide, please. Now, there are two controversies about skid that I would like to cover. Um, the first is whether patients should re routinely be prescribed an epinephrine auto-injector. And the second is whether patients should re routinely have their dose reduced during the pollen season. Uh, this would be to reduce the number of systemic reactions. Next slide, please. Now, the reason you would give <clears throat> an epinephrine auto-injector is so that the patient could treat a delayed reaction. There obviously is no need for the patient to have an auto-injector to treat a reaction that occurs in the physician's office under observation. So how frequent are delayed reactions? In those practices that kept their patients around for 30 minutes, uh, the information was pretty accurate, and they recorded 15% of systemic reactions occurred after 30 minutes. Of the delayed reactions, most were quite mild. 51% were grade 1, 44% uh, grade 2, but there were, it's covered up in my slide, but I think it was about 4% grade 3, which is a significant drop in blood pressure or, uh, or pulmonary function, and 0.3% were grade 4, which are those that are frightening. None were fatal. Now, next slide, please. Now, what are, what's the current practice of giving epinephrine auto-injectors? Uh, the uh, surveillance committee of the uh, uh, surveillance study of the subcutaneous immunotherapy surveillance study found that 14% of pra practices never prescribed them, and 35% prescribed them for less than 35% of their patients. While on the other hand, 29% prescribed them for more than 90% of their patients. They found that for the groups prescribing them or not prescribing them, there was no difference in the risk of progressing to a grade or three or four reaction with a delayed reaction. And of 144 patients experiencing delayed reactions who had been prescribed epinephrine, only 21 or 15 percent actually administered it. So the conclusion of the uh, people who wrote the article was it is debatable whether prescription of epinephrine auto-injectors, and it's covered up on my slide, uh, but it was debatable whether it was worth prescribing them. Um, next slide, please. Now, I'm going to show you two slides on the question of reducing the dose. The first one is from Wilford Hall uh, Allergy Clinic in San Antonio, Texas, which along with uh, 
Austin are the uh, capitals of the mountain cedar season every December to March. So they decided if giving shots containing those extracts during a pollen season was ever going to be a problem, it was going to be with mountain cedar. So their method, they collected all of the patients who had systemic reactions that were treated with epinephrine and then significant reactions during a period from 2005 to 2013. And then they compared <clears throat> systemic reactions in the patients who were receiving mountain cedar and hence at risk for aggravation or more likely systemic reaction if they received their mountain, their mountain cedar extract during the pollen season and those patients who were not receiving mountain cedar in their extract and hence should not be at increased risk getting shots during the pollen season. Next slide, please. And the most important one is the top. You see this looks at systemic reactions in the mountain cedar season when they should occur in those who are getting mountain cedar in their extract and systemic reactions occurring outside the mountain cedar season when there should be no increased incidence in the people getting mountain cedar in their treatment set. And you see in the far column, it was 73% of the systemic reactions occurring in the uh, those who were getting mountain cedar in the mountain cedar season and 75% of them getting systemic reactions outside the mountain cedar. So and everything else uh, was the same uh, in and out of season and between groups. So very clearly receiving an extract from mountain cedar and not having your dose reduced during the extremely severe mountain cedar season did not cause any increase or in either the number or the severity of systemic reactions. Next slide, please. Now, this is the second study. Uh, this is a prospective study uh, between two groups at Boston Children's Hospital. Group one with 128 patients had no seasonal adjustment in uh, their immunotherapy dose. Group two whom knows is a little bit smaller. Uh, during March and June, for those who were getting tree or grass, and during August and to November, for those who were getting weeds, had the maximum dose limited to 0.5 ml of the one-to-one -one volume to volume, that is the maintenance extract. And the second bullet indicates that the maximum number of weeks to get to maintenance in the two groups was 32 weeks in those who were not having seasonal adjustment and 48 weeks or 50% longer in group two. That was not to say the mean or the average, but there were there was at least one patient in those groups where group two patient required 50% longer than the maximum uh, required in any of the group one patients. Next slide, please. So group one with over 4,000 injection visits had 18 systemic reactions and 14 patients. And the rate per injection was 0.429%. Group two in 4,393 injections remember they had more injections, um, 16 systemic reactions and 13 patients. So both in both groups it was 11. 11% 11 of the patients having sy systemic reactions. The rate per injection was slightly lower in group two, but as you'll see that was not at all significant. And there was no difference in the severity of the systemic reactions and no fatal or near-fatal reactions. 
And the next slide shows us comparison of the severity of the reactions, green in group one with no adjustment, yellow in group two with adjustment, and clearly the severity as well as the percentage of patients having systemic reactions was not changed, only the duration that some patients took to achieve their maintenance. Next slide, please. So now we'll compare slit and skit, since somebody has to do it. Slit. Next slide, please. Uh, this study was done <clears throat> in uh, Steve Durham's uh, clinic in uh, England. And the reason was they had shown that three years of immunotherapy was very effective in inducing a sustained remission. But nobody had looked at two years, and perhaps two years was sufficient. So that's why they set up this study. They studied the, the patients for two years, and then they stopped immunotherapy, and they studied them again one year later to see if any improvement they had achieved persisted. And the outcome was the nasal challenge. So 92 subjects with grass pollen allergic rhinitis completed the study. They were treated, and this is the important point, with the approved slit Timothy tablet used in the United States and the approved skit dosage for Timothy extract administered on a monthly basis or double dummy. And the primary outcome, as I said, was nasal challenge. Next slide, please. So this is the result with the nasal challenge. The first year on treatment compared to placebo, the symptoms were reduced 1.6 in the skit group, highly significant, 0.75 in the slit group, not significant, and the results in the skit group were significantly better than in the sublingual group. The second year, both groups did even better. Now, both groups are significant, although the slit, skit group is more significant by far. And the comparison between the two, two groups, although it still persists, is no longer significant. Then in the third year, one year off treatment, we see virtually all of the treatment effect is lost. It's not a significant in either group although the trend is still for skit to cause more reduction than slit. Next slide, please. And this shows the visual analog scale during the three grass pollen seasons. And you see in the first two, the yellow placebo is clearly not as effective as placebo, although the difference isn't significant. The difference uh, again, to the right, red, the group receiving skit is, uh, looks good, but again, it's not significant. The same holds true in the second with the same uh, approximate order of magnitude of difference, but again, none of them significant. And then the third year, one year off treatment, all effect is lost. Next slide, please. The other study that compared the two uh, was done in Denmark, 40 grass pollen allergic patients. In this case, there was no placebo. Uh, one group just received, did not receive immunotherapy. The doses used are the same as they were in the last study and the same as are the approved doses for slit and skit. Again, the nasal challenge was used to assess the clinical response in IG four IgG4 antibodies and competition assays were assessed to compare the immunologic response. Next slide, please. And these are the symptoms on nasal challenge. Uh, the green is those who did not receive immunotherapy. The green is the, the yellow is the sublacal, and the red is the subcutaneous. Now the first horizontal line is when the subcutaneous group first reached maintenance 
And at that point, the result was significantly better than not only the non-treated, but also the sublingual. Subsequently, uh, we see uh, measurements done at uh, five and a half months and 15 months. The, the untreated remain pretty much the same. There's a steady improvement in the sublingual group and a steady result in the subcutaneous group. The sublingual group, although it continuously improved, even at 15 months was not significantly better than the untreated. The subcutaneous group remained significantly better than the untreated, but was no longer significantly better uh, than the sublingual after the first measurement. Next slide, please. This shows the humoral response. Here the red is subcutaneous, the yellow is sublingual, and the green is no treatment. <clears throat> now both of the treated groups are significantly better than placebo, but the response in the subcutaneous group is about two and a half times that in the sublingual group. Next slide, please. You would think the sublingual would be adhered to better, but study after study has shown the subcutaneous or the adherence to sublingual is very poor, and when the two are compared, it's better with subcutaneous. So this was a community pharmacy database from the Netherlands. It was examined for patients starting immunotherapy between 1994 and 2009. You can see the numbers were quite large. Patients picked up their own prescriptions and then took them to the doctor uh, for the uh, subcutaneous. So they were able to measure adherence at picking up the extract or the tablets. 23% on SCIT completed three years of treatment, but only 7% on SLIT. And the dropout was much more rapid. With SLIT, uh, they dropping all out at 0.6 years as opposed to 1.7 years for the subcutaneous. And the final slide. This summarizes a comparison between the two. Advantages are above and disadvantages are below. SCIT has identified effective and ineffective doses for many allergens. It appears from the two studies I showed you that we use the conventional doses for each, that SCIT is better at least for the first year. And there are four studies showing efficacy with multiple allergen mixes, but downsides are inconvenience and more systemic reactions. That's exactly the advantage of SLIT, as greater safety and convenience. However, optimum dose regimens are defined only for the SLIT tablets. It probably is less effective, at least the first year. And I am showing you this because I'm not talking about SLIT, but multiple allergen mixes in the only study that was done appear to be less effective than the multi-allergen than the monoallergen mix. Thank you. All right, we have the time for one or two questions for Dr. Nelson. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing any questions. Well, Dr. Nelson, uh, once again, thanks for being here today and presenting. Um, as always, a very comprehensive and informative review of subcutaneous immunotherapy. Um, we appreciate your expertise and sharing your time and knowledge with us today and hope we can see you in the near future to do this all again. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Sorry we had a few glitches, but uh, I think it went pretty well. All right. Thank you. We, we appreciate it. Right now. I have a great day. Thank you.